The next product we're gonna look at that Pertec packaged inside this dual drive cabinet is the FD3712 that you see here. This is essentially a repackaging of ICOM's successful FD360 dual drive. And this is actually a better cabinet than the FD360 had. Its cabinet was kind of odd shaped, didn't lend itself well to desktop or to rack mount. So this, uh, this format was an improvement. Uh, the FD360 had been out for two, three years by this time. It came out in early 1975, uh, frankly, before the Altair was shipping. It allowed you to add two IBM compatible eight inch drives to pretty much any computer system. And it made it quite easy to add it. The way they achieved this was by putting the complex disc controller inside this cabinet and requiring only a simple parallel interface of the host. And frankly, most of the computers they integrated with um, already had a parallel board of some sort that would uh, suffice to interface with this. And if it didn't, it wasn't hard to add one or design a parallel board, much simpler than designing a disc controller, for example. So this drive found its way into um, a number of configurations, many computers, MINI, uh, like from Data General and DEC, people would hook these up to it because it was so much cheaper than buying one um, from DEC or Data General themselves. It also found its way into microcomputers before um, we were shipping Altairs, for example, the Intel development system, people hooked it to that. Uh, the Motorola 6800 development system, the Exorciser, uh, people had integrated it with that. And of course, once the Altair came out, the Altair Bus S100, a number of hobbyists turned to parallel interface boards and interface to this to get disk drives to their system. Um, as that got more and more popular, ICOM eventually introduced their, provided their own interface board to make this more of a plug and play solution. Otherwise, it was a fairly technical person had to get this going. But that allowed them just to plug this interface board into the S100 bus and get these drives up and going. They eventually provided some software for it as well. We'll get into that in more detail. Unfortunately for Pertec, by the time they were doing this conversion, uh, technology was changing and advancing rapidly that was quickly eroding ICOM's market share or market advantage for this product. And we'll get into that in more detail as we open this up. But now I'm gonna do a video cut and we'll take this cover off and take a look inside. The IBM 8-inch standard was a soft sector format, and so obviously we have a soft sector controller inside this drive cabinet. Now implementing a soft sector controller back in the days before disk controller ICs were available was a very significant design and implementation effort. Take a look inside, you can see the size of this disk controller board. It's very large with a lot of ICs, um, and in reality that's only half the controller. Uh, if you'll notice carefully, it's in a little two-slot card cage and these red ribbon cables hook the top board to the bottom board. So there's a whole nother board down in here of the same size and complexity as the top board. So all in all, there's about 150 ICs to make this controller work. And this is actually a fairly limited capability controller. It did not have the ability to format the disc. You had to buy pre-formatted disc to use with the FD360 and the 3712. That was not hard to do. I mean, the IBM standard was common, so it was easy to find a pre-formatted. But so as you can see, it's very complex making a soft sector controller. And this is one reason why they went with this approach to put the controller in the drive. It's much easier to design that controller once rather than try to design it and debug it over and over to work in a variety of different um, bus configurations in different types of computers. The only thing that had to change was a very simple parallel interface. You can also see why pretty much every one of the first generation of disk subsystems for the early microcomputers was hard sector instead of soft. Hard sector controller was much simpler to implement in TTL and they could be fit on a single board that would fit in an Altair or a Southwest Technical, that kind of thing. Uh, eventually, um, in fact, about the time the 3712 was coming out, Western Digital had started shipping their disk controller IC, the 1771, in volume. And on the one single 40 pin chip, it pretty much implemented everything on these two boards. Plus it could also format. Um, so you can imagine the difference that would make. The advantage that ICOM held by having a working disc controller was quickly disappearing because with that 40 pin IC, it became substantially easier to design soft sector controllers. And in the microcomputer marketplace, it wasn't long before soft sector controllers eventually replaced hard sector controllers because now you could actually design them even simpler than the typical hard sector board. 
All right, so let's take a quick look inside this cabinet at the design. In the back, you see the fan that gives us the good airflow like we talked about in the previous video. And um, you can see the power supply in the back. That is a commercial off-the-shelf supply like we talked about being more reliable and having over uh, current cutoff, short circuit cutoff, those kind of things that the Altair supplies didn't typically have. Um, down here, you can see that we've got the AC motor because we've gone with the 500 series disc drives. As we mentioned, those were a lot more reliable than the uh, 400 series drives that had the AC, excuse me, the DC motors. And so that was the trick that uh, was done to improve drive reliability like we talked about in the last video. All right, the interface to the host on this computer was three 8-bit ports. Two ports went from the host to the drive controller, one to send command data, uh, the other to send data to write, and then one 8-bit port came from the controller back to the host to return read data. So 24 bits altogether, three 8-bit ports and some grounds. There was actually no hardware handshaking involved. There were no stringent timing requirements. The only handshake that was present was um, actually in the command byte. So the least significant bit of the command byte, when it went to one, that latched the command into the disk controller. And it was actually up to software in the host to then clear that bit to zero in order to write another command uh, that it wanted the controller to take action on. So um, very, very simple design. The ports were always on, always in one direction. So there was no tri-stating or turning buffers on and off or transceiver switching directions. So as you can see, the parallel port requirement was extremely simple. Um, now we don't have the interface cable hooked up to this controller right yet. I wanted to be able to see inside better, but it hooks up to these two IDC connectors. Half of the signals come in here roughly, the other half go in down there. And um, we'll hook that cable up in just a bit and turn on a computer and let you see this running. That cable, of course, would have been custom to work with whatever parallel interface board you were using. And um, we'll hook ours up and get it going um, next, and we'll demonstrate CPM running on this machine um, using soft sector format. With the huge success of the Altair 8800 computer, ICOM decided to make it easier to interface their FD360 with the Altair and other early microcomputers. They did this by offering an interface board that would go in the Altair or the S100 bus, and then also by offering a couple of software packages to use the disk drive. What you see propped up here is the interface board. Upper right corner is the 50-pin connector that goes over to the controller. This provides the three 8-bit ports for the parallel interface that was needed. They went ahead and also added an EEPROM and a scratch pad RAM. You can see that down in the bottom right corner. You always needed a, an EEPROM to boot, up from a disk, so this included boot code. There's plenty of space left over on that EEPROM, so they added code to make it easy to read and write sectors and things like that. So with this solution, you really only needed this one card to add a disk drive. At about the same time, Altair was offering their new disk drive product. Uh, it required three cards to do this. Their disk controller was a two board set, and then you had to have an EEPROM card to um, include the EEPROM that would boot the disk. It wasn't part of the controller. So this is a very similar solution, um, but it only required one card. Now, in terms of software, again, it was a very similar solution. They offered uh, extended basic or a disk extended basic, just like Altair. Uh, ICOM called theirs DEBI, Disk Extended Basic by ICOM. That was the acronym. They also offered a development environment for editing, assembling, running, debugging, uh, assembly language programs. They called it FDOS. And that, of course, would parallel with Altair's DOS, Altair DOS. Uh, it actually came out before Altair DOS, and it was substantially better. Altair DOS was always kind of a late uh, and weak product for uh, Altair. And all this was happening before uh, Pertech bought both Altair, the MITS company, and uh, ICOM. All right, now, unfortunately, I do not have copies of FDOS or Debbie. If I get that, I'll certainly make a video and demonstrate it. By the time this FD3712 was out, CPM was taking off. Uh, CPM 1.4 was the first major release of CPM that went widespread, and that was available on this 3712, and later CPM 2.2 was available. Now, it wasn't actually distributed by Pertech, it was distributed by Lifeboat, who was a large software distribution company 
main thing they did was create and distrib distribute CPM for most every machine under the sun, um, including the 3712, like you see here. And of, of course, the popularity of CPM over the next few years just totally dwarfed the amount of uh, copies of Debbie or FDOS that were ever sold, which is probably why I was able to find a, um, a CPM disc for this cabinet, but not find uh, FDOS. All right, so let's go ahead and boot this. I have, uh, I have this controller inside the computer and it's hooked up. All right, we're gonna go ahead and boot the computer. To do that, we examine F1000. That is the address of the ROM on that card and just hit run. You can see the light on drive zero come on and uh, that light stays on. It stays at whatever disk was last selected. Okay, if we zoom in here. All right, we can see we're up running single density um, version 1.4 on um, icon disk. You do a directory. Now here back in the days of uh, CPM 1.4, the directory didn't go across the page, it just went down. You look on drive B. And if I could type, I'm trying to avoid this um, tripod as always, sorry. All right, so um, on these disks, I have like uh, XDIR. This is a columnar, and it goes like this to list directories. Don't have enough here to make a difference, but if I XDIR on B, where there's more drives, you can see it'll fill this column and then start the next column. And it sorts them all for you in alphabetical order. So this was a nice little sort program or uh, sorted directory program. Uh, you can run MBASIC. So of course, in the CPM days, you had uh, basic just like Altair did or Debbie did but then you also had CPM which is equivalent to FDOS or Altair DOS to allow full development all much more nicely integrated Let's see this will give us our two disk sizes and I guess I have to look at B to get the second size All right, now show us what we have free on both disks. All right, so these were um, standard IBM disks, got about 256K. Your system is up and running, uh, CPM nicely. Uh, it's a very nice setup. A lot of people um, went this route as they bought old hardware and old drives and put these together. Pertec um, got out of the business of it, but Lifeboat, I've seen newspaper ads in computer world and that kind of thing. We're still selling this in the early 80s, so uh, it had a continued life. All right, well, that does it for uh, the 3712. If I ever get FDOS or uh, Debbie, I will certainly demonstrate that, like I said. Also, I'm tempted to see what it was like to integrate the FD360 or this 3712 cabinet into an Altair without any help. In other words, using an off-the-shelf parallel card that might have been available in the early days and then trying to write some of my own stuff to integrate it in with BASIC before they had disk, maybe, you know, 4K or 8K BASIC, or maybe even uh, MIT's software development package, Programming System 2, which was using cassette or paper tape for I.O. Uh, that might be an interesting project, so I might do that uh, in the future as well. But following this, we're going to look at a follow-up, the next product, which is the 3812, which is basically a double-density version of this. And that's what we'll take a look at next.